Good evening. Good evening. That's a, that's a, that's a pleasure to meet so many friends here, to meet Martin Schumann, to meet Marcus Tatajiba, and to meet our friends of Flank and other Latin American societies. It's really a wonderful moment we are passing through despite this coronavirus. It's allowed the, at least that we gather and that we discuss some very important cases. So I, I wish you have a very good night tonight, this evening, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Please, Marty. Okay, um, so I tried to screen share now. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so thank you very much for the nice invitation and the nice introductory words to everybody of you. Um, I've been asked to talk about uh, the use of ultrasound and uh, I want to yeah, make you taste the full fruit and flavor uh, what ultrasound can actually give to the pediatric neurosurgeon or neurosurgery in general. So um, we divide the talk in diagnostic and intraoperative ultrasound. And if we think of intraoperative ultrasound, um, the first thing everybody thinks of brain tumors because that's where we use it most of the time. And if you think of brain tumors, everybody thinks of intraoperative resection control. That is, I think, where ultrasound is mostly familiar to, to most of us. But I want to show you that even for brain tumors, you can use it for much more. Um, you can start with screening for raised intracranial pressure and hydrocephalus. I will show you how that works. You can use the ultrasound to guide your ventricular catheter for an intraoperative EVD. You can use it to guide endoscope um, placement for endoscopic uh, surgery. You can even use the ultrasound for needle biopsy of larger tumor. Every tumor bigger than two centimeters, which is not in the brainstem, can be also used uh, and biopsied by ultrasound. And you can use it postoperatively, again, for management of hydrocephalus and, for example, for research tools like pre- and postoperative CBF measurements. So you can also use it for Chiari decompression to check for the amount of decompression. You can use it for all kind of interspinal surgery and localization. And we often use it in peripheral nerve surgery for diagnostic and intraoperative purposes. Talking about diagnostics, what can we use ultrasound as a diagnostic tool? Because that's normally we think the job of pediatricians or neuroradiologists uh, or pediatric uh, radiologists, but you should be able to do most of these things by yourself because then you don't have to rely on other people. You can use it for screening of raised intracranial pressure or monitoring uh, the intracranial pressure over time. I'll show you how to use it. You can use it very nicely to screen for ventricular size or monitor the ventricular size of the ch children with hydrocephalus you are treating. We use it and for screening and monitoring of pseudotumor cerebri and the effects, for example, of acetazolamide uh, therapy in these uh, children. I'm not going to talk about diagnostic ultrasound, for example, for spine pathology in the newborn we use it for craniosynostosis. We almost do not do any CT scans anymore to prove an open or a closed suture. It can all be done by ultrasound. And I'm also not talking about peripheral nerve ultrasound where we use it in nerve injury or in tumors, um, for example, in neurofibromatosis. So if we take the example of pediatric brain tumors, we need a screening tool because the reality is they often cause raised ICP and hydrocephalus, but the obvious symptoms are very unspecific and brain tumors are rare. So you would not initiate imaging for the first symptoms of vomiting and headache. Then you have the problem of accessibility to MRI. You have specific needs like cystation. So MRIs are often postponed. In consequence, many tumors are detected quite late when the kid is already exhausted, has a big tumor and a large hydrocephalus. So what we would need is something where we can very easy screen 
and uh, detect raised ICP and hydrocephalus, it should be non-invasive and radiation-free for children. It should be applicable without sedation also to smaller kids. And it should be or should have a very high negative predictive value. So if you exclude raised ICP and hydrocephalus, you need to be sure that this is true. Ultrasound can do all this, and I want to show you how you can use it for diagnostic purposes. If you think of an ICP, the first thing we do nowadays is an ONSD, which is optic nerve shaft diameter. This is the diagnostic window to the intracranial compartment, and you can see here that the subarachnoid space is very nicely connected alongside the optic nerve sheath. So if the intracranial pressure rises, CSF will be pushed in alongside the optic nerve into the orbital cavity in there because the dura can expand in the periorbital fat. The optic nerve sheath is going to dilate when you have raised intracranial pressure. And this is an online tool. This is a matter of seconds. So how you measure the ONSD, if we have the eye here in the anatomical uh, cross section, we take an ultrasound above the eye. It should be 10 uh, megahertz linear with a mechanical index. You have to adjust this and lower this not to damage the, the eye bulb. And then this is what you get. In red, we see the optic nerve, which is surrounded by the optic nerve chef. And then we have a picture like this. This is what we see in real time. In the middle is the dark black is the optic nerve. Then we have the blue, the optic nerve chef, and we always measure three millimeters behind the bulb. The same thing, actually, if you know how to look for, you can see in um, MRIs, like this actual T2 weighted MRIs is very nicely. And the question is, does that actually, um, I have just adjust something here, I'm sorry. Um, this is disturbing. Um, my presentation, so we continue. Does that um, actually correlate well to, to the ultrasound? And we investigated this in 46 pairs of patients where we had MRI on the ONSD uh, from the MRI and the ultrasound, and you see it's fairly similar. If you look at it, it correlates extremely well, or uh, ultrasound and MRI, but Correlation does not mean that you actually measure the same. So if you do a blend and almond blot, you see the bias is very low. It's 0.18. So MRI underestimates the true ONSD and the gold standard actually is the ultrasound. It's not the MRI by about 0.2 millimeters. So this is just something you have to keep in mind if you want to compare an old ultrasound ONSD with an, uh, or an actual ultrasound uh, ONSD with an MRI ONSD. So the next step is how does optic nerve shift diameter actually correlate with invasively measured ICP? We investigated 72 children with all kinds of measurements for uh, uh, ICP. As you can see here, we uh, investigated them awake and under general anesthesia or under sedation in all kinds of pathologies. And if the child is above one year of age, means it has a closed fontanelle and the sutures are more or less stiffened, you have a very, very good correlation in the whole cohort here of 72 patients with a correlation coefficient of 0.36. That means the higher the ONSD, the higher is going the ICP to be. If you look at the age, and if you look at children below one year, it becomes not that good anymore. The correlation is lost and if it's an open fontanel, there is no correlation. If it's closed fontanel, a little bit better. But basically, under the year of uh, under the age of one year, there is no good correlation, and you cannot use ONSD to assess ICP. Beyond that, it's a very very good tool. Why is that a very very good tool? Because you see here the cutoff which we have calculated, the cutoff from a large set of patients for to indicate an ICP above 10 millimeter of mercury is 5.3 millimeters. And it's an extremely good sensitivity and specificity. This is the perfect diagnostic test in this rock curve. And the cutoff for 20 millimeter of mercury is roughly 5.8 millimeter. It's not as good in specific, but still sensitivity is very 
So we have defined cutoff values. And now we have looked in 225 patients on the clinical relevance of ONSD with regard to ICP increase. And 104 children did not receive any therapy. They were just uh, received the therapy and to decrease ICP. And their mean ONSD was 5.8. And in 122 patients, we, from clinical decision-making, said there is no intervention needed, and the ONSD was 4.8, so a clear difference. And if you look again at the cutoff value, it's again 5.3 millimeters. So 5.3 indicates an ICP bigger than 10 millimeter of mercury, and also indicates a high likelihood of clinical relevance of the patient has. So... This is the first take home message and honesty above 5.3 is clinically relevant if you have a symptomatic patient. Now, look, now we move to the individual patient because we were only looking at whole cohorts. If we look at the individual patient, we have 10 patients here. And if you look now on in the individual curve, you see the individual has a linear relationship between ICP and ONSD. So in one individual, any change in ONSD is correlated one by one to change in ICP. And if you have two data points from one patient between ICP and ONSD, you can even take a formula and calculate the ICP from the ONSD. But you see in every patient, it's a very different curve. So that tells you that each individual has a very linear correlation. And this is, makes ONSD so valuable if you follow the patients over time and uh, want to assess a specific situation in the patient. Well, this has been the work of Susanne Kescher in the last years with this scientific workup of the data and has just been published in Child's Nervous System and is available to you. Now, we switch gears to ventricular size. I told you, you can also use ultrasound to determine the size of ventricles. If you think of ventricular size, you probably think of an MRI or a CT scan in those children. I want to show you that the first thing you should think of is ultrasound again, transtemporal ultrasound measurement of the third ventricle. The neurologists have done this for many years for movement disorders and looking at the midbrain and defined age-dependent normal values for children, which is 1.5 in a healthy child and about three to four millimeters in an adult. Now the question is, can we yeah. see the third ventricle by transtemporal ultrasound? And of course, the question, uh, the answer is yes, in 90% of the cases. So if you start from a transtemporal window uh, on the mesencephalic level, you will see here black in the middle, these two olive things. This is the mesencephal and the two cerebral peduncles. The yellow is the substantia nigra and the little asterisk is the aqueduct. And this is a, a axial scan. If you tilt then the ultrasound a little bit higher upwards and in the middle scan, we have the yellow arrow. This is the pineal gland, the two, Asterix is the, is the thalamus in between these two little lines. These are the two walls of the third ventricles. And if you measure here across, you get a very precise measurement of the third ventricle. So in 90% of children, you will be able to assess the third ventricle by a transtemporal ultrasound. The exception is only children with epilepsy or overdrainage, which have very thick bones. The next question, if you want to use this, is does TVD actually correlate with the gold standard, which is now the MRI? And here we have three examples of TVD. You're in the lower ultrasound, you again see between the two little asterisks, you see the two walls of the third ventricle, and it looks quite well. We have investigated this scientifically. Susanne, again, with Luise Schweitzer, our medical student, and they looked at 122 pairs of MRIs and con ultrasound TVD done at the same time when the MRI was uh, done. And you see again, an extremely good correlation between MRI and ultrasound. Correlation does not mean that you measure the same. If you do the Alt and, uh, Blend and Altman plot, 
you see very nice limits of agreement and the bias is 0.2 millimeters, 0.12 millimeters. That means in ultrasound, the TVD is 0.1 millimeter larger than in the MRI. And this is very nicely explained by the fact that here on the left side, the MRI is an actual scan and the ultrasound is a slightly angulated scan. So you have a little bit a higher passage or uh, transverse through the third ventricle, and that explains why it is 0.1 millimeter larger in ultrasound. But that is not relevant, actually, as I will show you later on. So in 90% of your kids, if you can see the third ventricle, you can rely on ultrasound as you would rely on an MRI scan. Now, the biggest question, if we want to use ultrasound to determine the third ventricle, uh, is the question whether changes in the third ventricular diameter actually reflect changes in the lateral ventricles. We are used to look at lateral ventricles. We normally don't look that much on the third ventricle. So we investigated 170 children and almost 400 MRI CT scans. Again, Louisa and, and uh, Susanna Skersha's work, which has been published recently and is available to you. And what we looked, for example, is changes of the cellar media index and the front occipital horn ratio after therapy of hydrocephalus. And you see nice correlation between the decrease in cellar media index and the decrease in third ventricular diameter in different types of pathologies, a very nice correlation of 0.7. And the same, for example, at the time of acute shunt failure. Here you see the correlation between the increase in cellar media index compared to the previous scans and the increase in uh, TVD in percent. Very nice correlation. And now we do the same thing we did in ONSD. We look in the individual and here we have eight individual with measurements between frontal occipital horn ratio and TVD at several time points and again, we have an almost linear relationship in the single individual with a correlation index of 0.9 something. So in the individual, any change in TBD, you can be sure has a one-to-one -one correlation to changes in the lateral ventricles. So in summary, changes in TBD signify changes in the lateral ventricle. You can be sure about this when you monitor this by ultrasound. That means you don't need a CT scan to know whether this child has a change in ventricular size if you can image the third ventricle and the third ventricular diameter. So if you, we come back now to our initial question that we need something to screen for raised ICP in hydrocephalus, for example, for a child which comes in with question, does it have a brain tumor, yes or no? So in five minutes, you do three scans of the orbit and check if your ONSD is above 5.3. You do three determinations of TVD. And if the mean is above two millimeters, you know that this child with tumor-like symptoms has an increased ICP and has hydrocephalus after 10 minutes. And then you do your emergent MRI scan. If the child has a normal TVD and normal ONSD, it's not very likely that it has a brain tumor, but you will miss some. You will miss those tumors in the posterior fossa, which are very small, don't cause hydrocephalus and raised ICP, but irritate the brainstem locally. And you will miss supratentorial tumors that don't cause ICP increase or hydrocephalus. But it is very good screening uh, method in the first thing. And you will observe these child, children and get a scan later. How can you use these techniques after brain tumor treatment, for example? This is a child which had this pilocytic astrocytoma removed. We see the third ventricle, we see the TVD preoperatively. And now postoperatively, you see how the TVD comes down postoperative from 15 point something to nine point something. And then we wean him from the EVD. We gradually raise the EVD and it comes to a new plateau and he is, um, you, this way you can very easily monitor. You don't need a CT scan after clamping of the EVD to know whether the ventricles blow up or not. You do it by ultrasound. And this is the 
TVD at the time of discharge. Different example, another pilocytic um, after removal of the, of, the, uh, of the tumor, we erase the EVD and after clamping the EVD, you see we get an immediate increase of the TVD. We do an ETV and the uh, TVD comes down in the following days. And this is the TVD at the time of discharge, which is remarkably smaller. You can compare with the scan immediately above. So for post-operative management, we don't need scans anymore. We just use the ultrasound to see whether we successfully wean the children. And the same happens, of course, with ONSD. At the time of uh, high ventricular pressure, we will have an increase of ONSD. So if you want to manage children with hydrocephalus, not only tumor children, we can we do ONSD and TVD on every routine visit. And the child comes in for a routine visit once a year. And then we know what are the individual normal values for ONSD and TVD when the child is well. We adjust valves if we want to do that. And we can see, are there any effects on ventricular size? You can detect silent over or under drainage. If the child comes in and suddenly the ONSD goes up, you know something is wrong or the ventricles dilate. Even if the child does not have symptoms, you have the first detection of shunt malfunction at a time when the child is still asymptomatic. If a child comes into the emergency room with vomiting and you think it's query shunt malfunction, if ONSD and TVD are unchanged, we do not do a CT scan anymore. We observe the child for one night and so far we had no false negative ONSD TVDs in this series of in the last years. If ONSD and TVD are up, we know we have shunt malfunction. We still get a scan for medical legal reasons before we go to the OR. After shunt revision, you monitor the recovery of the patient and the same is true after ETV or ETV revisions. You put in an ETV if the ventricles come down and the ONSD comes down uh, in the next days, you know that on the ETV is working. And if you check after a few months and everything goes up again, you know you have ETV failure, even without doing a scan. So this combination in our hands replaces a lot of CT and MRI scans uh, for follow-up and in the acute situation when a child comes to the emergency room. So currently, this is our number one tool in hydrocephalus and also suited to therapy management. And we wouldn't know how, to, how we did it before because it really uh, has changed our practice a lot. Just two examples. If we only see the indicator for relevant ICP increase is 80 patients. And you see with acute hydrocephalus, you have a high ONSD and you have a large ventricle. In pseudotumor cerebri, you have a high ONSD and small ventricles. So very easy to distinguish just by ultrasound um, raised ICP from pseudotumor cerebri. And this is a case example. Maddox is a six-year-old boy, fatigue, nocturnal aneurysis, and pain of the eyes. So very unspecific things. We do an ONSD, we see it's high, 6.4, 5.3 is the reference value, and we see small ventricles. So we suspect ICP increase without hydrocephalus and recommend further diagnostics. The ophthalmologist tells us no papilledema, everything fine. The boy is, has no raised ICP. We do a flabber MRI because we think he has pseudotumor cerebri. And indeed, we see that the left uh, or the right uh, transverse sinus is missing and the left transverse sinus is not contrasting very much. We do an LP with an opening pressure of 38 centimeters of water. And immediately after withdrawal of CSF, he's free of symptoms. And the ONSD comes down immediately. So you, this is a minute by minute thing. You can, after LP, the ONSD came down from 6.4 to 5.2. And then we started him off acetazolamide and we leveled the ONSD at about 5.5 under treatment. So we knew he's fine. And when we tried to wean him a, a year later, um, the ONSD was coming up above six and the symptoms recurred and eventually he ended up with an LP shunt. So very nice example to show you how these parameters can aid you in managing patients. Okay, now we stop with the diagnostic um, applications of ultrasound 
and move on to intraoperative ultrasound. As we all know, surgery depends on vision and visualization. We are visual animals and what we don't see doesn't exist for a surgeon. Uh, basically, that is true. So we need a morphological correlate, we need a target, and we need pre and obvious also sometimes intraoperative visualization because we benefit from intraoperative visualization very much. Intraoperative, the surgeon truly depends on what he sees with his eyes through the microscope and which is beyond the reach of his eye. He uses some kind of visualizers in the surgical field. It's the ultrasound, which is real time, or it's a neural navigation. But we know neural navigation is historical data. It's the data before we started surgery and brain shift and everything else makes the navigation less and less useful the longer surgery is, is carrying on. We can also use extra field surgical eyes like fluoroscopy or intraoperative CT or intraoperative MRI. And if we look now at cost, time and practicability, and the more red, the more cost, the more time and the less practical, intraoperative ultrasound is the number one in each category. It's the cheapest, it is the fastest, and is the most practical. And intraoperative MRI, which is a great tool, which we use a lot and which we love a lot, is expensive. It takes you one and a half hours to get the scan, and therefore the practicability is, is much lower. Although the resolution, of course, is unbeatable for certain pathologies like low-grade gliomas. So the ultrasound is the surgeon's third eye to see beyond. And as you all know from a song of fire of eyes, the three-eyed crow, three -eyed crow, uh, crow is, the, is the master of everything. So we need a third eye to see beyond in surgery. And in any kind of surgery you do, you can use the ultrasound. The role of ultrasound in surgery is orientation. You check is my craniotomy or my laminectomy in a spine surgery, is it correct? You look at the preoperative sono characteristics of the tumor. You localize landmarks. Where are the vessels? Where's the ventricles? Where's the cyst? Where's the relation of the tumor, for example, to a certain vessel which runs through the tumor? You navigate to targets. You can use it to navigate the surgical approach. You can do a biopsy or a puncture of the ventricles or whatsoever. You do a biopsy and a visual control as an alternative to frameless uh, biopsy. You place ventricular catheters, you navigate, you resection control, finally the resection control. Which uh, um, probes do you use? If you have a craniotomy, you can use these small curved or linear transducers, which you can even bring into the resection cavity. And for burr hole, you have special probes and burr hole Ultrasound is the most, most useful tool, as I'll show you in the next slides, because you can do a lot through a burr hole. You can do an orientation if your burr hole is correct. Are you on the sinus or next to the sinus, for example, are they at the edge of the tumor? You just check through the burr hole before you do your craniotomy. You place ventricular catheters and endoscopes. I'll show you examples. You Puncture an abscess or an hematoma, you biopsy a hemispheric lesion, which is large enough. And therefore, it is a true alternative to frameless navigation, which is much cheaper to buy and more versatile. There's no extra imaging you need for registration. And we know a MRI in a kit means maybe sedation if you don't have a navigation, navigational MRI. You don't need head fixation. You have minimal cost per use. You have minimal extra time and it's always live. So it's a truly viable alternative to frameless navigation in many instances. For example, ultrasound guided placement. You have a borehole ultrasound, you check the ventricles, you remove the borehole, you do a parallel movement of the needle and then you puncture the ventricle. You remove it and put in your catheter and this looks intraoperative, it looks like that, oh, sorry. Um, I have to run it through again. So intraoperatively, it looks like this. We have the burr hole ultrasound, we have the brain needle. We do our, our scan to 
determine the, the perfect trajectory, then I do a parallel movement and slowly introduce in the exact correct trajectory the, um, the ventricle and you see the dripping of the CSF. There's not much pressure on it, but we have a nice ventricular tap. If we have very small ventricles, we make a little bit bigger bow hole so that we can puncture the ventricle under permanent visual control, as we see here. And then again, we can insert um, the catheter. And I'll show you an example how we puncture the ventricles in a nine month old baby with a recurrent supracellar arachnoid cyst with optic nerve compression. And we do an ultrasound guided puncture with the endoscope for fenestration. You see not very big ventricles, nine month old child, uh, otherwise, you would need to use frameless navigation to hit these ventricles. So we do an oval shape burr hole. We have the troca of the pediatric endoscope next to the ultrasound. And this is what you see. We see the ventricles in the middle. We see the cyst below at six o'clock. You see the hyperreflexive choroid plexus. We do a scan backwards and forwards orient ourselves at the choroid plexus, which is hyperreflexive. Now we have a very nice picture, the cyst, the lateral ventricles. And now you see how I do a live navigation of my endoscope trocar inside the right frontal ventricle. And you can nicely see here on the left, you see the, this, the movement of my hands. And now you see, you see even the plop, you see Plop. Now is the you are inside the ventricle, and here we are with our endoscope uh, right on top of the arachnoid cyst. Similar situation: catheter placement, intraoperative guidance. We have this isolated uh, posterior third ventricular cyst in the third ventricle and aqueductal occlusion. So we want to do a stent catheter inside the ventricle and inside the cyst which you normally would use again, frameless navigation. And here we just do it by ultrasound. We have here the ultrasound, uh, we have the cyst. We don't see the endoscope. The, it's a five month old baby. This ultrasound is on the fontanelle. And now you see the laser fiber, um, which is here on top of the cyst. And when we see the bubbles inside the cyst here, we know that we actually have successfully uh, under endoscopic view. At the same time, I have the endoscopic view and see that what I'm doing and in the ultrasound, you see that I have now opened the, uh, the cyst and then the catheter is introduced under, under endoscopic view and then um, connected to, to, the, uh, to the shunt. And in the end, you check again whether your ventricle is actually your uh, catheter is in the correct position as I show you here. And we very nicely see the tip of the, the, tip of the uh, ventricular catheter in the third, uh, in the cyst, in the posterior third ventricle. And here's the lateral ventricle. And we can check and you don't need a post-operative CT scan or anything to be sure that your catheter is in the correct position. Finally, um, I show you an example, just what we have seen before in open fontanel, you tilt your ultrasound and then under direct vision, you puncture your ventricle. And we have the video coming here with a child with a post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. We see these, the, the parenchymal defect on one side. And here comes now the ventricular catheter under direct visual guidance inside the, uh, the ventricle. And we see the puncture and we have a very precise position. Talking about position, the question is, does position actually matter and how precise are we with this ultrasound guided placement? We investigated this in 128 first time shunt insertions, 90 patients we had enough follow up. First time shunts mean age four years and we hit 98 of 98 89 of 89 ventricles in the first attempt, mostly frontal catheters, 
the position of the catheter was in 65% ideal in the middle of the ventricle, not close to any wall. And only uh, in, in 3%, we were not in the ventricle, which we actually intended. We were too deep down in the foramen magnum or the third, foramen monoid third ventricle or contralaterally. So 89% of the catheters were in the intended ventricle, 65 in best position. And when we look at the occlusions, we had only a few early and uh, late uh, occlusions. And if you look at the catheter position, you see that um, four of the six catheters which failed were touching the wall and two were in the middle. So 3.8% of the catheters failed which were in best position and 12.9% of the catheter failed which were in non-ideal position. So positioning of the catheter uh, seems to matter and others have shown this in some other studies. There are studies of course which did not show an influence of the catheter position. Um, in our hands, the occipital catheters fail more often than the frontal catheters, so we have stopped doing occipital catheters in children. Ultrasound guided biopsy. This is a very easy setup. You put your ultrasound needle, uh, you, you have, we have a holder which, where you can fix the ultrasound probe to, to, the, um, to your... Um, um, Lila system, and then you have the needle inside, you go to your target, and then under direct view with the ultrasound probe fixed in the Lila holder, you go with the needle next to these vessels. You see, we push away a little bit the vessel until we are on the target. And then under visual control, you do your biopsy and you can also check immediately if you get the bleeding or anything like that. So ultrasound is, possible and a very cheap way of doing brain biopsies if you don't want to use a frameless navigation or stereotaxy. Finally, I show you a few examples of ultrasound guided um, resections of brain tumors. This is an example of uh, how we use it to guide the approach to the tumor. This is a three-year-old boy with a H3K27M negative thalamic GBM. And um, we see it here in the left posterior thalamus, large tumor, almost intact child, very, very mild hemiparesis, nothing else. And this is the sagittal scan. And in these children, we use this posterior approach, posterior parietal approach, um, three centimeters off the midline and in the postcentral region. And we use to push uh, under ultrasound guidance a balloon in the ventricle, then slowly dilate the, uh, the brain. And then in the channel we have created this way, we put in a plexiglass tube as a round retractor and through this we perform the surgery. So what you see here is now the ultrasound guided puncture of the ventricle just on top of the, of the tumor. The tumor is, is down here. You see the tumor down here. Here is the ultrasound guided thing. And now you see how under ultrasound guidance, we start filling the balloon to slowly, slowly distend the brain, softly push the brain apart, not to suck your channel down and destroy the brain. And here again, we have now finally dilated a nice channel inside the brain. And in this, we can just now push down very gently the plexiglass, uh, plexiglass tube, and then we are on top of the tumor right away. Very straightforward guided approach to the tumor. You cannot use this ultrasound for these deep seated lesions very well for resection control. So we did intraoperative MRI, which shows that most of the tumor is out. We still have a little bit of, of tumor here. And this is then the postoperative CT scan with a gross total resection in a child which had no, no other problems except a little uh, acceleration of its hemiparesis, which went away in a few days. Now, ultrasound assisted tumor resection, six year old girl with a progressive pilocytic astrocytoma, which was operated at age three and it has been growing. And we have this large uh, tumor in the tentorial in Cisura, partially infratentorial, there's an infratentorial cyst down left, uh, down right image, and we have the tumor extending up. 
You can see this best, I think, here in the coronal scan with the tumor in the tentorial incision with a high-grade brainstem compression. What you see is that the PCA is inside the tumor, the posterior cerebral artery, and uh, down um, we also have the superior cerebellar artery, and we decide to use the old approach, do a transtentorial approach to reach the intra tentorial compartment and to dissect the tumor off. And I show you now the stepwise ultrasound. This is the ultrasound prior to surgery. We see the tentorium here. We see the vessels. We briefly saw the PCA here. And um, here we have, we see the posterior cerebral artery, which is inside the tumor alongside the tentorium. These are the, the different cysts of the tumor. This is after some kind of resection. We see the pulsating posterior cerebral artery inside the tumor. Down here, we see the superior cerebellar artery. We have already reached the tentorium here and will now open the tentorium. This is now after opening of the tentorium. We have the posterior cerebral artery here. We have the trochlear nerve here in the opened tentorium. And now we proceed with the surgery, we still have to take this off the brainstem. And this is at the end of resection, we see the posterior cerebral artery. Down here is the uh, posterior cerebral artery with its branches. The tumor is now removed. You see the uh, superior cerebellar artery down here. And this is the brainstem. This corresponds to this part of the brainstem. And this was the end of resection with a nice post-operative result, very little residual tumor down here and a little bit residual tumor alongside the posterior cerebral uh, artery here. This picture now shows you something which is very important. If you look at this scan, you will say, Dan, here we think there is still residual tumor. Why didn't he take this out? Fortunately, we didn't do it because it's the brainstem. This is here. But why is the brainstem so bright and it looks like that there's residual tumor? This is a very uh, known um, artifact in ultrasound guided surgery, but you need to know this to interpret the, uh, the images correctly. This is our post -oper end of resection scan. And the ultrasound waves are attenuated in the tissue on the left, on the right, in these two red arrows. And because the, it, it attenuates the, the beam, and inside the water in the middle, in the reception cavity, the beam travels much faster. And because it travels faster, it hits the end of the reception cavity. It hits the brain tissue with a higher speed. And therefore, we have an enhancement, a signal intensity, and it looks like residual tumor. So the, the mecca of intraoperative ultrasound is in Trondheim in Oslo, in the group of Geimund Unskar, Unskar who is the, the god of intraoperative ultrasound. And they know, of course, of this problem. And they have started to develop an acoustic coupling fluid, which actually has the same sonographic behavior like normal brain. That means inside the fluid, the sound travels at the same speed like inside the brain. And then you get rid of the artifacts. And you can see this very nicely here on the left side is a normal picture with normal saline. You see the attenuation of the, uh, of the image with the hyper echogeneity. And on the right side, the cavity is filled with the acoustic uh, coupling fluid. And now you can clearly see that there where the red, there, where the orange spot is, this is where there is truly residual tumor. And this is an example on the left side, you would think that there is residual tumor. And when you fill the cavity with this acoustic coupling fluid, you see that there is no residual tumor at all, that you have a complete resection. So these images are taken from the publication with the permission of the authors. I talked to Tormat. And the, we think that this acoustic coupling fluid will be available on the market in, in about one to two years. And this will make a, a huge difference in intraoperative ultrasound imaging. Another example on the right side now is the ringer um, image. And on the left side, we have acoustic coupling fluid. And we can now clearly see the residual tumor, which was not so clear before. 
The last case I wanted to show you is how you can use this in spinal cord tumor resection. This is a 15 month old boy with torticollis. This is his only symptoms, no other symptoms than that. And we see this very, very nasty pilocytic astrocytoma, which is diffusely infiltrating the whole spinal cord. This has no clear cut borders, except in the very top, in the very beginning. And you can see also on these um, scans here that it is a diffuse infiltration of the surface of the spinal cord. And that was exactly the intraoperative situation that this was a diffuse infiltrating tumor. And you can also see in the higher resolution ultrasound, this is at 14 megahertz, our intraoperative linear scanner. And you see no clear border whatsoever between the tumor and the surrounding uh, spinal cord. And here again, there's not even an, a hint where the tumor ends and the normal um, infiltrated uh, spinal cord tissue would start because it was indeed infiltrated. You see now the upper part, and you can nicely mark when you start opening the, the uh, spinal cord uh, between the dorsal columns, you put in a little piece of gel foam or Cersei cell and you can nicely mark your dissection borders. This is the upper border. And this is the lower border of your, of your opening in the spinal cord. So you make sure you are in the right spot in a situation like there where the tumor and the brain, uh, the spinal cord tissue look very much the same. And then actually we did in this case a totally ultrasound guided resection because there were no borders. We just went in there and the, the uh, potential IOM were more or less stable and more or less reliable in this child. And then we just work our way down according to ultrasound criteria and said, okay, this is probably the border. You could not actually distinguish it by eye. And then you work your way down in the spinal cord and always remember that we have an attenuation in the middle. So the hyper intensity on the bottom is a wrong hyper intensity. This is not necessarily tumors. So we worked our way on ultrasound criteria, uh, did a nice debulking. This is the post-operative scan on the right side. Almost all the contrast enhancing tumor was removed and uh, we still had some edema and we were quite happy with this result. And here you can see the infiltration of the dorsal columns and, and part of the spinal cord by the, by the tumor. So in summary, we have a very broad application field for diagnostic and interoperative ultrasound, which I hope I could show you in the last hour. Actually, from a diagnostic point of view, the ultrasound is the best friend of the pediatric and also the adult neurosurgeon, I think especially for the uh, pediatric neurosurgeon because of the high load of hydrocephalus cases. And it helps us solve most of the problems in, in daily business with ICP and ventricular size. It's a great research tool. We work on global CBF and local CBF. We have not talked about contrast enhanced ultrasound and many other options which ultrasound might offer us, elastography, things which will enhance the, the, the possibilities of ultrasound in the future. It is a research tool. We are working to assess intracranial compliance with ultrasound. It is a great monitoring tool for everything connected to hydrocephalus. I showed you that you can navigate everything you want to stick in somebody's brain. Always use the ultrasound to know where you are and to see real time what actually is happening when you push things in other people's brains. Uh, it's an intraoperative tool for resection control and with elastography and contrast enhanced ultrasound, we might even put things further. And then there is the new integration of ultrasound into uh, neural navigation systems uh, like BrainLab or other companies where we will have a 3D ultrasound incorporated in the preoperative uh, images. And this works already quite, quite nice. And I haven't talked about intraoperative vascular imaging. You can look for the vascularity of tumors. You can look in AVMs, where are your fetus coming? You can check aneurysms and um, very nicely also in the vascular cases. So in summary, please use ultrasound whenever you can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin.
very nice presentation. Very, very nice presentation. Exciting topic. I think that we have some questions for you. Uh, Martin, first, uh, uh, I have a question for you. It's, uh, did, do you, uh, uh, did you show um, in different applications for ultrasound? It's very nice because uh, you have different tools, so different probes for each uh, useful. Uh, otherwise, uh, what is your opinion about uh, uh, prematurity to use uh, Doppler uh, associated with ultrasound? If you have this, if you if you use this to study uh, hydrocephalus in, uh, in prematurity, or yeah. if you do use uh, Doppler to study ISP signs uh, in patients that you need to, to study? Yeah, well, the neonatologist, of course, use the um, Doppler of the ACA in, in these premature babies very much and are have much more routine in that than I personally have. But with the normal ultrasound uh, probe, which you have the normal intraoperative ultrasound, you can do all those B-mode Doppler things, which you also use in prematurity. Um, the only critique I have on, on this uh, kind of, of investigation is that the pressure which you put on the fontanelle with the ultrasound probe, this pressure is not standardized. And uh, nobody actually knows how much pressure you put and to see whether your diastolic flow is going away. So this is a highly uh, obje uh, subjective a non-standardized investigation, but very useful in, 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 in the daily routine also to make the indication of whether you should treat a hydrocephalus or not. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Yes, of course. Uh, I think the use of ultrasound is uh, dependent absolutely with the operator. My question is how long is the learning curve to use uh, with, with uh, the not great of precision in the, in the patients. Thank you. The, in general, the learning curve of ultrasound is is pretty pretty fast. For ONSD, for example, I would say if you have done twenty uh, examinations uh, with somebody on your side, uh, you should feel pretty confident. TVD takes a little bit more. I would think that you should have investigated 50 patients and with somebody checking whether you are the correct level, but it's also not too difficult. And intraoperative ultrasound, it depends really that you use it every time. So we offer a, a workshop for ultrasound uh, and to actually teach all those techniques. It's together with Llewellyn Padayachi, which is one of the pioneers in intraoperative ultrasound and, and diagnostic ultrasound. He was one of the first people to explore ONSD in children. And we have this ultrasound workshop every year in Tübingen in November. Nelsie has been there as in our first ultrasound course. And um, uh, everybody's invited. It is this year on the 7th and 8th of November in Tübingen. It's called WUPIN, W-U-P-N. Uh, I will, can send it to Ricardo and he can send it to every, everybody who is interested. The WUPIN, U-P-N-workshop.org. And you're all welcome for, for, for training. I think the important thing is you use the ultrasound as often as you can. And we have been stealing ultrasound machines in the whole hospital for, for our outpatient clinics for the first two years until we had our own machine. This is how you start. I mean, you just take a machine and, and exercise. Thank Congratulations, you. Martin. Fantastic lecture. Really, uh, you explore several use of ultrasound that it doesn't use. And your course is really very practical course. I recommend is and this, this auspice of uh, World Federation also. We encourage the neurosurgeon to do it. But in our reality, uh, is not so common to use until now. Since I know, uh, we doesn't use uh, routinely. 
uh, it you show us uh, a little bit difference uh, we saw in the literature in the past uh, systematic revision that there is no difference if you put your VP shot in front or uh, posterior way. You find out that in posterior is uh, not so uh, well uh, placed catheter. It's your experience is the reason because you move in the front away, even though if you have a contra incision to do the, the VP shunt, yeah, you don't so have additional infection or other complications because you have probably the most impressive rate of well-placed uh, ventricular catheter, almost 90% of precise uh, position. Well, um... I think it's several factors. One factor is where you place the catheter and in our hands, the occipital just did not work that well. And we had a, just a higher rate of choroid plexus inside the ventricular catheters. If, if we do a frontal um, catheter, we can make with help of ultrasound sure that it is in the frontal horn anterior to the foramen of Monroe. So you get rid of all the um, choroid plexus um, inside the, the uh, ventricular catheter. The other important thing I think which has really reduced the number of ventricular catheter obstruction is that we use over drainage protected shunt systems from the very beginning. So a child will over drain whenever you bring it in a vertical position, even if the child is, is, a, is a year old, it will start over draining already. So, and that creates a suction. And since we use shunt systems where a child will not have any suction and any flow in the upright position, I think this is another contributor to a low rate of ventricular catheter obstruction, both positioning and the, and the overdrainage protection. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jaime Diego Perez from Mexico. I'm a true lover from ultrasound in the OR, I think is one of the best tools that we have uh, already. And I think that is clearly better than MRI and, and CT scan in the OR. Uh, we sometimes use uh, this transition for uh, small spaces with uh, uh, Hartman or uh, physiological solutions but a bag to, to make our ultrasound? Have you already used something like that? No, we, are, we, we are actually using normal saline. I have been experimenting a little bit with some kind of gels which, uh, which you can actually put on the brain, which, which, uh, which is allowed to use, but they still don't have the same ultrasound characteristics like um, the brain. So we still have this uh, enhancement effect at the end of the resection cavity. So I think the acoustic coupling fluid from Trondheim is going to be a very good solution. And they worked, worked for, for many years now on it, first to have it the right composition and to have all the biocompatibility studies. And I think in one year to two years time, it should be available. Okay, I'm, and uh, which company do you have your transducers? Because uh, I think that is not available in North companies, isn't it? Well, the Burhol, the Burhol transducers are available from traditionally from Aloka and Hitachi. Um, the Siemens and Philips, they don't bother to do that, which is a pity. Um, we have the Aloka ultrasound and now more recently, the Danish company BK um, offers also ultrasound for many, many years. And they have a, a machine, which is our recent, most recent ultrasound is the BK, which has the Burhold probe and very good probes for intraoperative ultrasound. And they are price-wise not the most expensive on the market. And they are specializing in, in ultrasound uh, for for surgeons for different kinds of surgeons so for me this is at the at the moment the 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 best machine but I totally agree it should be cheaper to be available to everybody in in also health systems which have not that much money around it should be cheaper 
And there's some adapters to uh, transvaginal and uh, transrectal ultrasound to do biopsies. Do you know if there's some uh, adapter for a, a prof to, to make uh, biopsies? Yeah, the, the, the biopsy, the, the, the PK has also adapters for biopsies too. So to every uh, of the ultrasound probes, you have a fitting adapter. They are single use. So you have to invest in our setting, I think 20 euro, if you want to use an adapter for biopsy. But compared to that, what you have maybe to pay for an extra scan, if you do a stereo taxi, 20 euro is, is cheap. An extra scan will cost you more uh, than that. And for the, for the, um, for the Aloka, I showed you the adapter which we used in, in, in the presentation. So you, these adapters are available for biopsy if you don't want to do it freehand. Thank you. Griselda, have, would you, oh, did you say something? Yeah, uh, congratulations, amazing conference. Uh, I want to ask, what is your experience with the use of ultrasound for drainage abscess and MPMS? I didn't understand my experience for using it for, for trainees. Uh, for drainage, yeah, in abscess and uh, MPMS. Okay, can so, you repeat, uh, Griselda, a yeah. little bit louder? Um, uh, can for I... abscess, is that right? For abscess. Okay. I'm, yeah. Um... You can use this very nicely for abscess. In our environment, brain abscess are not so common. Uh, so we don't have a huge experience, but I have used this in draining abscesses. It's, it's very nice, like, like a cyst puncture. If you puncture a cyst with the endoscope, you can also puncture an abscess with a catheter or puncture with the pediatric uh, endoscope, the, the abscess and, and irrigate under vision. So it works very nicely, except it is in the brainstem. I mean, if it gets really deep, um, then the accuracy of ultrasound and the visualization power of ultrasound is, is low if you go very deep. But for hemispheric lesions, no problem to, to use it for puncturing precisely and irrigation of the cysts and the abscesses. Okay, that's it. There is Sebastian Jaimovic, his hand right. to ask questions. Are you there? Uh, hello, Martin. Yes, yes, I'm here. Uh, Hi, thank, you all. thank you all for, for this uh, wonderful presentation. And thank you, Martin, for this enlightening uh, subject. I have just two small questions. One is uh, uh, neurosurgeons in your department are doing uh, this, the, the ONSD and the TVD or you are uh, working together with echographers? Um, we started it from the neurosurgery side because the radiologists were not interested and uh, they thought it's a waste of time. They think it until now, uh, which is stupid. So that's what I said. We The first two years we were stealing ultrasound machine from the radiologist and the ICUs uh, whenever we could to, to do it on our ourselves. In the meantime, we have our own machine and we train our residents to do it so that it is not depending only on Susanne and myself. So I would think about in our department, about 10 residents are able to do ONSD and about three or four residents are able to do reliably a TVD in children. It's mostly the pediatric team for the TVD but the honesty is also used in, in the adult world for, for many questions. And the best thing is you do it yourself. Otherwise you have to rely on radiologists and you know what it means to work with a radiologist. I mean, he never has time, he never wants to do anything. And so better you do it on yourself. Mm. Excellent, uh, thanks, that, that was, uh, um, mm. the, I think the, the, very, the very important point because uh, you are free of, of using this low-cost technology uh, whenever you need it. And uh, if you are starting 
in a department and want to train and start with it with this technology, which ultrasound uh, probe model or manufacturer would you recommend for the most versatility? So if I, I'm, I want to start using this technology uh, and I have the, the, the funds, the money to buy one um, uh, ultras, ultrasound equipment with one or two probes, which one would you recommend uh, regarding uh, hertz and, and stuff? Okay, so I would, um, I would buy one machine which you can use for diagnostic purpose and for interoperative. So you can take it with you to the OR and you can use it outside the OR um, if you just can buy one machine. I, I think you need a 12 megahertz linear scanner, um, which you can use for ONSD and for peripheral nerve ultrasound and for localizing anything, uh, tumors or whatever in the skin or an abscess in the skin or whatever. You use a 12 megahertz linear scanner, which you use for ONSD. Alternatively, you use the intraoperative linear scanner, the 14 megahertz, which you can also use for ONSD. And it's small enough. That's the one I showed you uh, on, on the, the, the small linear scanner, which you can use then for intraoperative ultrasound and intraspinal ultrasound. So one, ideally, if you only have one linear scanner, you just take the, the 14 megahertz intraoperative scan which you can use for ONSD outside the OR and intraoperatively you can use it for high resolution scans. Then you need a little curved array, eight to 10 megahertz, which is the standard uh, probe for intraoperative ultrasound. And you can also use it for transfrontal ultrasound in outside the OR. It's the same ultrasound uh, probe for, for these applications. Then you, you need a, you can buy a burr hole uh, probe because then you can use ventricular catheters and endoscopes and puncture cysts and puncture hemorrhages and everything you can do through a burr hole. And for TVD, you need uh, maybe to share it's the same probe the um, cardiologists do uh, use for cardiac ultrasound. It's a five megahertz um, array probe which normally is used for cardiac ultrasound. So you may be able to share this with your cardi cardiologists, and but it's also very useful for for sometimes you you get not only the TVD from here. In many of the children with this probe, if the the bone is not so thick, if you go a little bit higher, you get a very nice view. I would say in fifty percent of the kids of the lateral ventricles. So you have both the TVD. And if you want to check the ventricles, you get it uh, trans, transcranially from the side. So three to four probes and uh, a machine which you can easily carry in and out from the OR. Excellent, Martin. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Martin, may I ask? Yeah. Martin, Martin? Yes, uh, Congratulations for your excellent work in uh, ultrasound. Uh, my question, Marty, is about um, hydrocephalus. There mm -hmm. are many situations when we are in, if we have to put a shunt or not, mainly for those situations of ventricomegaly. Uh, for example, after performing IHV, you may be in doubt if it, that uh, situation is it stable or not, the hydrocephalus is compensated or not. A situation when you have a huge hydro, uh, ventricle, and, but the patient has also a hypoxia uh, situation in, in newborn. And many situations mainly relate to the uh, ventricle megaly. If the situation is a uh, chronic, hydrocephalus or a situation of arrested hydrocephalus. Uh, what do you prefer to use? Uh, uh, optical nerve sheet diameter or a TVD? We are not quite sure at the moment. This is, you're talking about uh, the question whether the ventricular megaly is pressure compensated hydrocephalus or pure atrophy. This is something we have been investigating um, so far with a more 
physical means by either putting in uh, overnight recording pressure probes and or doing reservoir infusion studies. So I leave after each ETV, I leave a reservoir and then we do a computerized uh, infusion study to actually measure compliance and measure um, elastic, uh, elasticity or in the overnight monitoring, we look for um, the typical pattern of pressure compensated hydrocephalus. Uh, we are just about to publish this. I hope this is gonna be published in the next two months. And here we have the physical basis of an, a clear signature of pressure compensated hydrocephalus versus atrophy or something you don't need to treat, which has a normal compliance. I can't answer at the moment how is the correlation of TVD or of ONSD to these type of pressure compensated hydrocephalus. We have started to work on that, to come and, but we have not enough patients where we can compare um, data from overnight monitoring or from reservoir infusion studies, so physical parameters to the ultrasound parameters. Um, I think this is not going to be easy because uh, if you have a chronic, if you have a chronic arrested hydrocephalus, you once had a pressure active hydrocephalus, which then went into a pressure compensated hydrocephalus. And these patients tend to have a larger ONSD because if it is chronically distended, the optic nerve shaft becomes kind of uh, sloppy and it never comes back to normal. And for currently, we cannot give good cutoff values or good values to actually say, if it is above that and that, you need to put in a shunt in this chronic ventricular megaly patient. I hope I can answer this question in five years. Okay. Hamilton, <laughs> maybe a comment on it. Uh, we don't have uh, the numbers, the values, but in some case, uh, it's useful to try to do uh, the non-invasive uh, intracranial monitoring. Um, we don't. We have the waves. The advantage uh, you can uh, do uh, several times and try to see if you have some changements. Uh, you can see some uh, difference in wave forms uh, before uh, the papilledema and uh, before uh, the signs of intracranial hypertension. Sure, we have limitation, the head circumference, and uh, if, if the child is not quiet, we don't uh, give value to the answer, but uh, helps in some case. I don't know if you are using already in the University of Sao Paulo, uh, we just start some cases and can be useful. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin, even for uh, Doppler analysis, is that reliable to distinguish this situation? Uh, we by have do actually, by, by Doppler. No, we haven't. We haven't actually assessed uh, by Doppler. Um, routinely, so you kind of we never checked the correlation by for mean flow velocity of the MCA or of positivity index or autoregulatory indices, which you can calculate. Um, we haven't done that in in in, in patients because this. To do this reliably, the patient needs to be very compliant. So in the patient who is fighting. Um, and not laying really, it's very difficult to do a very um, high quality Doppler examination if the patient is awake. You can always get a TVD even if the patient is fighting. Um, it's the easiest thing is to get a TVD. The patient is crying and fighting. The ONSD is not reliable either because as soon as the child is crying, the intracranial pressure goes up and you will measure a higher ONSD because the ONSD reacts immediately to, to crying. So the patient needs to tolerate the, the ultrasound probe on the eye. So uh, in general, above three years of age, most children, if you take some time and if it's not a crazy kid, it can work from three years onwards. So it's still but a question. In, hmm? It's still a question. Yeah. So, yeah. but above three or four years, it's, we, we use it, for example, to monitor craniosynostosis and secondary craniosynostosis after. It works very well. 
Take a watcher. Benicio, would you say something? Yes. Uh, first, I wanted to thank you for sharing uh, your experience with us. I think most of us learned a lot and changed our views during the uh, OR. Uh, my question was partially answered. Uh, because in our setting, I think the most of, of us, we share the same machine that the anesthesiologist, anesthesiologist use to access the central venous line. So we have to have a, a larger uh, surgical field to fit the probe. So uh, I, I think we have a comment that we have a, a, a nice set of probe. Isn't that right? Well, we have, we have the luxury that we don't have to share with the anesthesiologists, but for example, with the, um, the the probes are most of the time not so expensive compared to the machine. So um, if you buy an extra probe for you, like a burhole probe, um, but burhole probes are rare. It's not too many uh, manufacturer actually have burhole probes. But for the for the other probes, you I'm sure if you're anesthesiologist or pediatric intensivist. Uh, might have the probe already you need, or you just buy the probe and add it to the, to the ultrasound machine. The probe normally is only in our environment, it's between three to six or 8,000 euro compared to several 10,000 euros for the ultrasound machine. So it's, it's probably easier to buy a probe than buying a machine. Martin, we have some uh, questions for the participants. And uh, one is about, in fact, the two questions that almost the same. How do you prepare the operative field for the interoperative end of resection ultrasound to minimize the brain shift and air artifacts? And uh, just to complete this uh, question, if you use uh, something different from saline, to minimize the artifacts at the end of the surgery? Uh, currently, we don't use anything different to start from the end because nothing else is kind of allowed to use. So the only thing you can put on a patient's brain is saline or ringer solution. Everything else will be a legal problem. And um, the, that's why we wait for the acoustic coupling fluid, which will then be CE marked and FDA approved. Um, regarding preparation of the field, you should always try to have the, your, your opening, your craniotomy more or less in the highest point, which is of course sometimes not possible because other aspects of positioning are more important. But, if you do simple hemispheric uh, tumors, it's probably always good to have your craniotomy at the highest point because then you will have the best um, coupling with fluid and the least brain shift if possible. But brain shift is not a problem because ultrasound will always correct for brain shift. You always have a life problem. It's more a question of how to fill your your resection cavity with fluid that you have a an a equal level of fluid in the whole uh, resection cavity yeah uh, we have another question uh, ricardo gap is uh, here ricardo please would you would you say the question directly yes yes hi martin how are you hi ricardo how are you doing perfect so Martin, uh, I'm, I'm asking about the, the use of the ultrasound combiner of navigation. So this is a, a, a cost effective uh, tool. Do you think that this, the use of navigation with the ultrasound can decrease the learning curve, especially to brain tumor surgeries? I think so. Um... I mean, the, the learning curve is pretty steep if you actually use the ultrasound in every brain surgery you do. If you every time use the ultrasound and if you start, I mean, you, you need to some basic principle. You need to know what is your, your plane of the ultrasound. And you start with a coronal view where you have the uh, falx as an orientation point or you look for the skull base as an orientation point. If you try to do it systematically and say, okay, there's my ventricle, there's my falx, there's my tentorium, 
then you get a much better orientation and you need to make sure, okay, now I have a coronal, now I have an axial, now I have a sagittal. So try to do it in the same planes as we are used uh, to do, to read CT scans and MRI scans. The 3D ultrasound with integrated, integrated into a navigation system certainly is helpful, but it's a very still expensive thing because you need to buy a plug-in for the ultrasound machine, which is not as expensive as the plug-in plug for the navigation system. And I would like to have it. I use it in my courses. I demonstrate it um, by the company, but currently the company wants quite a lot of money for, for being able to integrate the ultrasound into the neural navigation. And I think this price needs to come down because otherwise not many people will use it. The real sexy thing about the integration of the 3D ultrasound will, I think, start in the near future is when you use the ultrasound to correct for the brain shift. So your preoperative imaging is not helpful anymore because of the brain shift. Then you do a volume scan of ultrasound and you will be able to correct your navigation system and uh, your preoperative imaging data with this, like with an intraoperative MRI. And when this is established, then this 3D ultrasound integrated in a navigation system will be very, very helpful. Not yet, but I think pretty soon. Okay. Marty, we have another question. Uh, if you apply the, o the ONSD diameter on evaluation of TBI from head trauma, yeah, you can do this. This is an excellent tool, for example, to um, assess if a patient needs an ICP pressure monitor. So um, it is if you if you have to if you're not sure if you want to put in a pressure monitor, you can every day at time do an ONSD and um, see and if the ONSD is high, you put in a pressure monitor. So the neurologists have already published quite a number of papers um, for in stroke patients to determine when the pressure goes up and whether the patient needs a decompressive craniectomy. And, and just to give you an example from, from two days ago, we had a child coming in with multi-organ failure and she had a hepatic encephalopathy and we needed to intubate her and she was already neurologically a little bit impaired and then she needed to to be intubated because of her um, failure of, of the cardiac system and um, we couldn't assess her anymore. So we did ONSD. The ONSD was 6.4 on both sides. So we were sure the intracranial pressure is way above 20. And when she went, she needed to go on ECMO because she had, no, uh, she had heart failure. So during the ECMO procedure, we put in an epidural pressure monitor and the pressure was 40. So this was perfect example that the ONSD led to the decision of putting in a pressure monitor. And then we could treat her for her raised intracranial pressure. And at the end of the night, she was down to 20. And we would not have known that she has raised intracranial pressure because the CT scan, the last available CT scan was not telling about raised intracranial pressure. So very useful to monitor patients on the ICU and decide. Um, and if you have an individual course and you see the patient had a normal ONSD and the next day it's one millimeter more and it increases more and more, you know this patient develops uh, raised ICP for sure. Okay. Uh, we have an interesting question. Uh, if you use ultrasound to decide to open or not the dura on Chiari one malformation? Well, this is nothing new. This has been done many, many years. And Milhorat, for example, has described this technique already 20, 25 years ago, when he um, even tried to do Doppler measurements at the craniosovical junction. Um, the problem is quantification. So it's not easy to actually quantify that what you see. And I try to measure CSF flow at the craniosovical junction like Doppler flow, which sometimes works, but there are no normal data. Milhorat has tried to do that. Um, 
So we basically rely just to see after we do the bony decompression, if actually the CSF space appears behind the tonsils, and then you can weaken the dura a little bit more. And if you see everything expands and you create more space, uh, you can use it that way. But there is no quantification, nothing like a parameter or threshold established in the literature, according to my knowledge, at least. OK, Tatiana, Alexandre, would you say something? Yes, Patricia also is raising okay. hands. Hi, Martin. How are you? Thank you, for, uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you for your lecture. Uh, a lot of uh, information, and like Neosi said, you don't. We don't use the ultrasound like you, so it's nice to see all uh, uh, the tools that we have with only one uh, um, ultrasound. So this is very nice. I wanted to know if you use for all VP shunts to place the catheter, you use always uh, the ultrasound or only for difficult ventricles to achieve. And if you think that the position of the catheter in the ultrasound can be related to a less uh, 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 index of shunt dysfunction. Yes, so we use it always, it is obligatory. So if I catch a resident who is not using it, he is in danger not to, to go to the OR for some time. So it is in our standard operating procedure, it is a duty thing. So you have to use the ultrasound. And the reason is you need the practice and you need to practice on larger ventricles so that you hit a one centimeter ventricle or a, a small ventricle. So you need the practice uh, doing this freehand and, 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 and getting the coordination between the probe and the brain needle. I mean, this is just a practice thing. And if you are very uh, fluent with this, then you can also do all the, the difficult and small ventricles. Um, my main experience is in placing it in the frontal approach. I use it always for placing, for puncturing the posterior horn in posterior fossa surgery. So if I take out a medulloblastoma or something like this with large ventricles, I don't do a frontal burr hole and then turn the patient around. So I take the patient prone right away and do a posterior burr hole. And with the ultrasound, very nicely, you can puncture the posterior horn and then you open the posterior fossa. So um, I have no experience in these posterior approaches, actually trying to get the catheter under vision into the frontal horn, because this is very deep, and then the, the other resolution of the ultrasound is, is, is not that good. We just aim at under the roof of the ventricle, so we get the trajectory from the posterior shunt, we aim it high under the roof of the ventricle, and then we measure the length of the catheter on the CT scan. But this way, you can also make sure that the that the catheter is is not positioned too far down, where it gets in contact with the choroid plexus. So you can use it for that, for sure. Just a practical but, question, uh, Martin. Did you uh, reach the ventricle by needle, like you was talking with Tatiana, or you reach the ventricle by the catheter? I think this is a, a question of, of, of habit. I personally measure with the ultrasound the length of the catheter, then I prefabricate the catheter to the burrow capsule. I use the brain needle to do my ventricular tap and you just need one attempt. I mean, with ultrasound, you always hit on the first attempt in, in the tra trajectory you want. And then I puncture once and I feed in the, the catheter, which has already the, the, the burr hole reservoir connected to it because I have been measuring the length before. But certainly you can use the catheter instead of the brain needle, but then you have to fiddle around and connect it somehow uh, to the rest of the shunt. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hello, Martin. Hello, Hello, Martin. How are you? I'm uh, fine. Thanks Thank for you. Your, thanks for your wonderful presentation. And I, I've been doing ultrasounds 
in the last 10 years. And I used to say to my residents that, I, that, that the best purchase I've, I've done in my life is my, my ultrasound apparel. And uh, because I always uh, take in along with me in many places in, in the OR, at the consultation and, and uh, the, the hospital. And I, I always do, especially in the toddlers, transfrontal uh, exams. And I, mm-hmm. my, my perception is still, if the, the fontanel is closed, one can do transfrontal because the, the bone is, 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 is very thin. We can use the, the transfrontal window even in the, the one year, one year and a half. But in older children, that's my question, uh, instead of use the, the third ventricular diameter, I sometimes I, I, I use, especially in the quiet ones, I use the, the Doppler uh, uh, across the, the transtemporal window. I use the Doppler in the, 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 the cerebral media. Uh, to to check the the resistance index. Sometimes when we when we think about hydrocephalus or some, some kind of, of intracranial hypertension, and always it it uh, it I can I can find if is higher or or it's it's not a a, a higher IPC. Have you ever been in any situation that you you may use this this trans temporal window for for this this kind of measure, or always you've been doing uh, the TBD? Well, we have um, it's the same window, so and it's basically the same uh, the same ultrasound probe which you use for Doppler and for TBD. It's the same probe. So we have we sometimes do the Doppler just to see the vessels and for yeah. orientation, especially as I showed you in the beginning, you can nicely see the old circle of villas, but we have not actually um, trying uh, or compared resistance index uh, or positivity index to ONSD. This would be interesting to actually see um, because for honesty, we have a very good correlation to ICP and we have thresholds which we now can rely on due to the work of the previous years. And it would be interesting to see if there is any correlation to positivity index or resistance index in MCA Doppler. But we haven't right. actually investigated that. Because we okay. are currently very happy um, because ONSD reacts very fast and and we know that you can have ventricular enlargement without increased intracranial pressure and you will miss all that if you just look on resistance index which normally as in my belief only will react to higher intracranial pressures okay and with nice, TV, thank you. you see everything uh, the ventricle immediately yeah yeah nice thank you more directly Okay, I would like to come back to craniovertebral patients. So uh, sometimes it's easy to see the, the CSF fluid after a, only the bone discom- the compression. So, but sometimes not so easy, and you do a very good decompression. You open the ligament, but the dura is stay closed. Do you have any a special clue? Of course, it's not in the it's not in the literature, but do you have any special clue to to use and don't touch the dura and and if no. you no <laughs> <laughs> no unfortunately I have no clue um, I have no clue I'm, I'm uh, nothing that really that's what I said there's no quantifiable anything that tells you if your CSF flow um, is below that and that speed open the dura or something like this so it's I I can't really give you any any good data. And when I do it and I see it is very, very qualitative or uh, nothing quantitative. 
it would be good to have something, but I can't offer anything at the moment. And do you see any space to use the ultrasound in tetra quad patients? Well, we use it. Um, we use it first when you, as a first screening in in a newborn baby, you can very nicely look if they have a low lying conus, um, if you have some obvious changes in the back of the child, you do an ultrasound and you can look in between the, uh, the lamina, you see the conus. So you, it's, it's quite good to determine if the conus is low. Um, we use it for untethering surgery before opening the dura to see where exactly is the tethered cord attached to the dura so you know where to cut. Um, that's how we use it intraoperatively. Okay. Patricia, uh, Charles, please. Charles, would you say? Oh, Patricia? oh yes. Uh, hello, Martin. Uh, congratulations okay. on your presentation. And uh, my question is uh, still about the, the use of ultrasound in the VP shunt surgery. Do you think that the use of ultrasound can uh, increase the time uh, of the surgery and uh, maybe this is a risk for uh, infections uh, for shunts a lot of a lot of, of things to 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 do with the catheter and the ultrasound uh, what do you think well it's it's actually in it does not change your operating time i mean you do your hole you open the, you do your little dura opening, then you take your ultrasound, you look for your trajectory, and you punch to finish. So this is an additional, additional ten seconds which you need to to get the correct trajectory. And if your, of course, if you if your ultrasound drape is not sterile or you have a hole in there, you bring something different to the operating field the ultrasound head, but provided that your ultrasound cover has no holes and it was done as every other surgical tool, I don't think that it increases the infection risk. So our infection rate is 2%, so it's low. A, a, a larger bureau is not very important. It's very quick to do. A large bureau. No, you don't need, um, I do a standard bur hole in not a larger bell hole with the bell hole probe, provided you have a bell hole probe. I just use okay. a standard bell hole. It doesn't matter if the fontanelle is open in the small kits, you can use any, okay. any, any kind of, of, but in the others you need a bell hole probe. Okay. Uh, Dr. Schumann, thank you very much for the nice talk. And uh, I would like to ask you about the, the evaluation as a, the, of ultrasound as a tool to evaluate the residue of the tumor. Uh, do, you, do you correlate with the uh, MRI at the end? We're happy with the, with the ultrasound to say that a resection is done like a, to, the, to the borders of the tumor. What do you think? Have you, have you been correlating with this uh, uh, MRIs or you're happy with the ultrasound? Um, so we have published a few years ago um, a large series of low-grade gliomas. In it was 30 patients prior to ultrasound, uh, prior to IMRI, and 30 patients after IMRI. Only low-grade gliomas, where I think, which I think in children is one of the best indications for intraoperative MRI, because it's a question of cure or not cure, and um, we we always proceeded in the way that we used intraoperative ultrasound, and when we thought we were done, we then did the intraoperative MRI, when according to ultrasound criteria, there was no residual. And the result was that MRI detected in a significant amount of patients. We only 50% of the times we were really clean, and we increased this with intraoperative MRI after, after additional resection to 80% real total resection of low-grade gliomas. So an extra 30% then. Especially in deep-seated lesions, um, everything thalamic or deeper um, ultrasound is not precise anymore because it's too deep and the resolution goes down. 
um, IMR is still beneficial. This might change if we use this uh, acoustic coupling fluid because then the artifacts are away and I think we will be able to see small tumor remnants much better with this type of fluid than we do currently when we put in saline. Do you have experience with the micro, bu micro bubbles as a contrast enhancer to evaluate like the, the ultrasound mm -hmm. images at the end of the resection? We haven't, um, we haven't done that. We are starting the project at the moment. You need to do it in vascular tumors. I mean, obviously you will need a certain vascularity of the tumor. And so it will might work in pilocytic astrocytomas or, um, or um, ependymomas or medulloblastomas, which have a good vascularity. Um, I haven't actually done it. In children, we need, you need an ethics um, permission because the, the micro bubbles are not licensed for children. So we are, we are filing that at the moment, uh, trying to, to explore this contrast enhanced ultrasound. So Francesco Prada from Milano has published quite a bit on that, but mostly in adults. Okay, thank you very much. Martin, we have one question. Uh, if you if you compare if you compare adult and children uh, using parameters, <laughs> using using ONSD and TVD as a parameters, uh, do, in your opinion, are there differences? Uh, between adults and pediatric uh, patients? Mm, regarding ONSD, no. They're because you get it, adults are even, are always compliant unless they are very old and, uh, and, and uh, senile or demented. So ONSD works very well in adults, um, as in children. The TBD is not in adults, you have more often thick bones. So normally we say in 60 to 70% of the patients, we will have a good temporal window for Doppler. And that's the same window we use for TVD. But in astonishing, when we do our course, our ultrasound course, we got TVD in almost all participants. So it, it works. Okay. Anyone? We have a question for uh, the chat. Is uh, Dr. Alessandra Gorgulio? She tell uh, ask you about uh, vascular lesion. If you have some tips for cavernoma or AVMs, and if you can talk a little bit more about probes, size, frequency, and uh, and so on. So vascular lesions, um, I use it for, for AVMs just to see where are the feeders coming and trying to get a three-dimensional and check whether that what I see from the angiogram, how that relates to, to, to the reality. And you can nicely define the nidus. In cavernoma, most of the time are not very vascular, but it's very nice to locate the, car, the cavernoma. And for example, you can use the ultrasound and then you take a ventricular catheter and you push it through ultrasound guidance directly to the border of the cavernoma and, and then you have defined your approach and you follow this down to the cavernoma. So you can use it for this. Um, I, but I have not a vast experience with 50 AVMs where we try to map AVM angio architecture with ultrasound. But um, it's very useful to, to see where the, where the feeders come and, and where the veins are, uh, or in aneurysm surgery um, to, to get an idea where is the sac and, and in, to which side of the, so you can, of the Sylvian fissure, for example, what is the extension of the sac? So you can use this. Regarding probes, as I told you, for the standard intraoperative probe is a, a small head curved array. I can show you in the presentation. I think um, we go here to the to the ultrasound and uh, 
So this is what we what we normally use for for intraoperative ultrasound. Um, a normal eight to ten megahertz uh, probe, where you can here is the clip for the when you want to put in a a, a holder or a, a guidance for for a biopsy. This is the the intraoperative uh, linear scanner, which you can also use for ONSD. Nicely to be used. You can put this nicely on the eye and do ONSD. This is the Burhol probe. And for for TVD, you need a cardiac, a normal cardiac transducer, which has five megahertz. You always need to remember the higher your frequency is, the less is the depth. So this with the 14 megahertz, you cannot see further down than than maybe um, than maybe three or four centimeters. Thank you very much. Uh, Dunia Patricia, are you ready to do the question? Are you listening? Yes, thank you. Still I alive? was asking, uh, do you hear me? Yes, yes I do. continue, thank please. You. I was asking about hydrocephalus, septated hydrocephalus, if it has helped you more, because that is a difficult task. <laughs> Well, it depends if you have, if you want to use these to navigate your, for example, endoscope through different cysts. Um, it is possible if you have an open fontanel or if you do a little craniotomy, if you just use the burr hole, um, you can only use this to puncture the first cyst to get the endoscope in, in the first cyst. Uh, um, but then you need a second access for the ultrasound probe, like either you use a little craniotomy or in a small baby where you have an open fontanel. The deeper it gets, the more difficult it is. So in deeper lesions, or if I connect several uh, cysts, um, then I tend to use frameless navigation. Okay. Okay, okay. thank you. Some more questions from the panelists to Martin. March is too late. <laughs> <laughs> Germany. That's fine. It's, it's like it's like an on call. No problem. I still can <laughs> sleep five hours. That's five enough. Hours for ahead. Yeah. I have a very short question, Martin. The wonderful presentation. I, I love ultrasound. I love. I really love it. This is a very important tool for us as pediatric neurosurgeon. Unfortunately, the, the resident, the young people, don't have experience with ultrasound. Normally, understand only CT and then MR. But I, I think uh, ultrasound is really very, very, very important. Uh, it's a very short question. Uh, what's the name of the, the firma? that produce this uh, uncle uh, transducer. I think this is very nice. Yeah, this transducer is BK. This yes. is a Danish company which has specialized on, on surgical applications. So they have a lot of probes for different types of surgeons and also for neurosurgery. So this is the, the machine I decided. I had the chance to buy a new machine for the OR last year. And I looked at different types and I, I decided for BK because they have uh, many features and you can even later on connect it to frameless navigation and integrate it there. And it has a burrhole probe. And um, they also have a cardiac probe um, if you want to use it for TBD. So um, for me, this is currently a very good choice. Thank you. Adrian, would you say something? Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Hi. Um, how are you, Martin? I would, I would really like to uh, comment because I had the opportunity, you know, the honor to be one of the revisors of the papers that Martin has written on this. And I think that very few times in medicine, you are able to see something that is so rigorously documented. I mean, there is no doubt 
that he went through all the necessary steps to prove that all these measurements are really accurate. I really commend you to read these articles. Uh, they're brilliant. And my question to Martin, uh, as you know, I am always puzzled and quizzed about overdrainage syndromes. So uh, have you gotten any valuable data in patients with this so-called overdrainage? Um, well, what you see is that the, that the ONSD is very small. So these children, when we when they suddenly go down with their ONSD, when they overdrain the ONSD, is the optic nerve shift, shift collapses, so it's gone. So you're suddenly with parameters at four to 4.5 millimeters. So this might be an indication that you, that you have overdrainage when the ONSD is, is really low in the lower end. Um, but we have not uh, systematically, because we don't have so much overdrainage because of our shunt systems anymore, but we had some cases where the overdrainage protection device failed and the children, we detected this because the TVD was going down. We said, Who, what is that? TVD is going down. And in some cases, also the ONSD was then decreased to the value a year ago. So I think, um, but we have not systematically actually looked into it in because we don't have so many cases with uh, overdrainage syndrome anymore. Thank you. Martin, now I'd like to thank you so much to be here with us until now, until this time. So very nice presentation. You see, would you like to add something? Thank you for all the panelists to still with us until now. Thanks for the audience. It was wonderful for the questions. And uh, I hope it was excellent for all of you. We learn about it, a lot of ultrasound with you, always, Martin. Continue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. It was my great pleasure to meet you all uh, in these uh, special times. And I hope we will meet and have enough opportunities face to face uh, to see each other and it was my great pleasure thank you very much thank you thank you thank have you bye bye hi martin bye 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 you good 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 that you that you can listen <laughs> <laughs> Very pleasure to see you. See you, hopefully in November. <laughs> bye, Martin. Bye bye, bye Francesco. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.